All right. Thanks so much to the organizers and for everybody for joining us today. Um, I'll be presenting uh, an interesting collaboration, which is essentially the, funded by my K award um, from NIAD. And it is the uh, National COVID Zero Survey from Sierra Leone, which we'll, we just submitted for publication and is actually the first nationally representative antibody survey for COVID from the African continent. Um, I originally had a grant for the social epidemiology of Ebola, which I've been working on for the past four or five years, and then converted the grant to COVID. Um, and then when in last February, when John and Kengasong from the Africa CDC prevent, presented uh, the continental vision for COVID containment uh, for African Union member states, we all combined our efforts um, to uh, design zero surveys for a variety of countries. And, and Sierra Leone happened to be the one to um, finish first. And so here's part of our team um, going out to some of the outer islands for this uh, random survey. Primary objective was to define the age and sex specific zero prevalence of COVID in the general population up till March of 2021 uh, when we conducted it. And then a secondary objective was to uh, identify risk factors for seropositivity. The previous research had shown um, in 5.2% uh, prevalence in Kenyan blood donors. They actually recently re released a, a preprint during the third wave saying uh, that there was a 48% prevalence, but this is only in blood donors, so it's not representative and they're not using a very good assay. Other studies have looked at healthcare workers and found a variety of seroprevalences from 12% in Malawi to 45% in, uh, in Nigeria. And in Nigeria, we had been hearing this. I was, I was seconded to the Africa CDC uh, last August, and we were hearing from our colleagues that lots of people were dying, uh, elderly people dying from pneumonia, but they weren't recording or testing them for COVID. And so, um, Part of the aim of this study is to understand what underreporting might look like. So we improved on the previous studies by using a better performing assay and then enrolling a nationally representative sample. Um, we found that we needed about 1,200 households for power. Interestingly, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a quick aside, I'm involved in a, a project at UCSF where um, uh, cases of COVID are identified, and then we essentially go to the, their houses, and if they have people living with them, we enroll them in all the household members, and we bring them a freezer and put it in their, in their uh, garage, uh, where they take daily samples, nose, saliva, and uh, fecal samples, and freeze them, and then we come by and get blood every five days. Um, and that study did not need IRB approval is as invasive as it was and, and identify, there are all sorts of identifiable data because it's public health surveillance. And I thought this was going beyond public health surveillance, but they were adamant, UCSF was adamant that this did not IRB approval. So same with this study of the Ciro survey, it's public health sur uh, surveillance, Harvard uh, gave it a not research determination, but Sierra Leone did wanna review it and they gave us uh, their IRB approval. Africa CDC provided the kits and support for field teams. And then again, we conducted it in March. Um, so what we did was we asked Statistics Sierra Leone to uh, give us 120 uh, randomly selected enumeration areas. And they're kind of like census tracts of uh, 80 to 100 households. Then we took a satellite map of each one, numbered the houses, numbered the rooftops, and picked 10 random households. We picked one to two people per household. and we. We had to uh, constrain it because there's a large amount of young people uh, in uh, African Union member states. And if you just pick randomly, you would get a lot of young people. So we had to constrain it so that we could get uh, um, uh, an appropriate amount of across the age uh, cohorts. And then we collected uh, capillary blood with finger stick and used this uh, bio, right sign bio test which was shown in FDA testing to have 100% combined sensitivity and specificity. We also did a local um, uh, uh, assay, uh, local testing of the assay and found the same numbers. And this is important because when, when I was running the uh, Ebola surveys, we found that 
uh, for the assay we were using, the negative controls in Europe and America had zero signal, but negative controls in Western Africa had all sorts of signal, presumptively due to circulating pathogens that we haven't even identified yet. And so it's a reminder, it's important to use negative controls from the uh, local area because it can change the thresholds for, for your testing. So uh, here's the demographics and um, we, uh, I'll show you the preprint so you can look this up, but here's the important results. Uh, the unweighted seroprevalence was low at 2.8% overall. We found that it wasn't quite random in some of the outer rural districts, so we weighted it um, and so got an overall weighted of 2.6%. You can see the rest here. Um, an important uh, finding was that rural, rural and urban were different, which is most places show something similar. It was 4.2% 4, 4 in the uh, urban capitals, um, and that difference was st statistically significant. Um, and so the finding um, you know, of 2.6% of the population being exposed means that an estimated 218,000 people were infected out of 7.8 million. And this is actually not that high compared to regional estimates, uh, you know, uh, even though no one's done a nationally representative zero survey. The important thing is that this is 43 times higher than what their case reporting is. Um, and so it means a couple of different things. One, it indicates that the um, that herd immunity is far from being achieved, and even if they had herd immunity, uh, you know, it probably is not as uh, helpful for the Delta variant that is now coming through in a third wave. And although it, it was low compared to Europe and the Americas, again, this uh, it, it's it indicates enormous underreporting, and this has strong, uh, significant ramifications for what's going on across the continent. Um, which is experiencing a third wave. In Sierra Leone, they're now reporting around 90 cases per day. And if the same underreporting from two months ago is occurring, which I think it is, it actually means there's about almost 4,000 cases per day. This also means that pre presumptively regionally, uh, the reports we're getting that you know, they're experiencing a, uh, a significant third wave are probably hugely underreported. Um, and so, so it means that, um, you know, we containment efforts have to be strengthened, uh, but at the same time, it, it points to the problems of vaccine nationalism slash vaccine apartheid. Like what this is, what the ramifications are for places like India and uh, Sub-Saharan Africa that they've, you know, Sierra Leone's only been able to get enough vaccines for 0.2 percent of its population. So here you can see evidence of the first wave, second wave, third wave. Um, we multiply all these by 40, and then you start to get an idea of what the real burden of uh, COVID cases are. So they should, uh, these data should strengthen um, uh, demands for fa faster vaccine deployment um, and uh, support for intellectual property waivers and technology transfers. Um, we have some articles on that in BMJ Global Health. Um, and then Sierra Leone should also aim to strengthen active surveillance and we've been sharing these data because you know, Ministry of Health people were involved. Um, and even with the Africa CDC, what the ramifications might be for other countries. Quick on the limitations, you know, we're not sure the effect of waning immunity on the assay since only uh, the controls were recently infected people. And then the exact sensitivity for minimally symptomatic infection is not necessarily known. So here's the preprint. Uh, you can find it on MedArchive, and it's under review at The Lancet currently. And then I'll just end by a quick plug for work that I do as, uh, so my PhD is in anthropology, and I'm in, a, I'm in a department of global health and social medicine. So what I often do is use data like this to, to see what the, just, the underlying justice claims are. So here's a recent book I've written um, on the coloniality of global public health. It has strong critiques of how we use big data, causal inference, and infectious disease modeling, um, and how a lot of those efforts often support status quo relations of inequality. Um, here's another paper we did um, as part of, um, I'm the co-chair for the Lancet Commission on Reparations and Redistributive Justice. We did some anti-racist modeling to look at what rep reparations played to, uh, paid to Black American descendants of persons enslaved in the US might look like on um, SARS in this, SARS-CoV-2 in this country and found that it could be 30 to 60% less. Um, and since this is not about that paper, I'll just leave it to you. I'll put it, uh, links to it in the chat. Um, but thanks very much for your attention and look forward to the uh, discussion at the end.